Good evening. I'm David Van Slyk, Dean of the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. It's my privilege to welcome you to the spring 2018 edition of our Tanner Lecture Series. Up front, I would especially like to thank Bethany Wallowender, Sunju Rabeck, and Kelly Coleman from the Dean's Office and the Campbell Public Affairs Institute. Stan Ziemba, Tom Fazio, and their team from Maxwell's Information and Computing Technology Department, the external affairs staff of the Maxwell School, the staff at Hendricks Chapel, and the generous and hospitable staff of Syracuse University Catering. I would also like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, the indigenous people upon whose ancestral lands our university now stands. We are forever grateful to Maxwell graduate and advisory board member, Dr. Lynn Tanner, who has generously endowed this very special lecture series that benefits our students, our faculty, our university, and the broader community. Since 2012, Tanner Lectures have provided Maxwell the opportunity to bring some of the most prominent civic doers and thinkers of our time to visit campus, meet with our students, faculty, and staff, and speak on topics of ethics, citizenship, and public responsibility. Previous speakers, including Senator Bill Bradley, Governor Lincoln Chafee, and Secretary of State Madeleine Albright have entertained, engaged, and challenged us. And I have no doubt that today's distinguished speaker, one of Syracuse University's own, will do the same. Worldwide, the Maxwell School is known for its outstanding faculty. Among our more than 160 teachers and scholars, we are fortunate to enjoy the remarkable service and leadership of Dr. Grant Rear. Grant is a graduate of Dartmouth College and earned his PhD from Yale University. He's a professor of political science and director of the Campbell Public Affairs Institute. And many of you here tonight may also know Grant as the creator, host, and producer of the Campbell Conversations on WRBO Public Media, an award-winning NPR public affairs show. Tonight's event will feature Professor Rear interviewing our guest, Etan Thomas. They will discuss Etan's most recent book, We Matter, Athletes and Activism, which along with his previous books, Four and All, that would likely get him tenure and promoted, <laughs> have heightened awareness and provoked our thinking about issues of social justice, equality, advocacy, and mental health. Etan's writing has been described as an inspiration for many people, sports junkies, young readers who need words of encouragement, parents seeking positive messages for their children, activists who want to hear athletes using their voices to address social justice, and schools to provide motivational material for their students. But perhaps no speaker thus far in the Tanner series has done more to leverage their visibility to publicly engage and encourage others to engage on many of, of America's most pressing and challenging social issues than Etan Thomas. Etan Thomas, I proudly mentioned, graduated from the Whitman School of Management in 2000 and played for 11 years in the National Basketball Association. He has received the 2010 National Basketball Players Association Community Contribution Award, as well as the 2009 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Foundation Legacy Award. Etan's wife, Nicole, a successful entrepreneur, is also a Syracuse University graduate of the College of Arts and Sciences and the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Following tonight's talk, I encourage you to pick up Etan's latest book, get it autographed, and join us, along with Etan, back in the Strasser Legacy Room in 200 Eggers Hall for a reception and further conversation. Now I'm gonna stop there because it's not my role to introduce the speaker for tonight's Tanner Lecture. In fact, it's my job to introduce the person at Syracuse University who likely knows Etan the best. James Arthur Beheim Jr. has earned two degrees from Syracuse University, an undergraduate degree in history from the College of Arts and Sciences in the Maxwell School, and a Master's of Social Science from Maxwell. 
Jim is a Hall of Fame coach with the distinction of having guided only winning teams during his tenure as coach of the Orange. He has led our team into the postseason in all but two of his 41 years, including 32 trips into the NCAA tournament, five Final Four appearances, and an NCAA championship. Coach Beheim achieved the ultimate basketball tribute in 2005 when he was inducted into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. He was honored by having received the John R. Wooden Legends of Coaching Award and is a Spirit of Jimmy V honoree. In the fall of 2000, he received Syracuse University's highest award, the Aarons Award, an alumni honor, and two years later, the university named the Carrier Dome Jim Beheim Court. A longtime participant in the USA basketball program, Coach Beheim was named 2001 USA Basketball National Coach of the Year. He has served as an assistant coach for the US Olympic team that won two gold medals in 2008 and 2012, and the World Cup in 2010 and 2014. While we are proud and appreciate all of Coach's accomplishments on the court, and that he's a Maxwell School graduate, more than that, he's led where Maxwell is most proudest. He's a remarkable citizen of the university, of this city, and our country. A champion of many charitable causes, Coach Beheim and his wife Julie have founded the Jim and Julie Beheim Foundation. He has worked tirelessly on behalf of Coaches vs. Cancer, Krauss Hospital, the Children's Miracle Network, the Elder Care Foundation, the Make-A-Wish Foundation, the Pioneer Center for the Blind and Disabled, Easter Seals, the Special Olympics, and the Rescue Mission, among others. In the spring of 2016, Coach Beheim received the Circle of Honor Award, presented annually by the American Cancer Society to a college coach who has shown an extraordinary commitment to the Coaches Versus Cancer program. It is my honor to welcome Coach Beheim and ask him to introduce this evening's speaker. Coach. Thank you. It might be the best introduction I've ever gotten, so thank you. <laughs> Usually when the Maxwell people talk about me, they don't mention that I was a Maxwell graduate. They try to keep that closely guarded. It's like a guy once told me in Cincinnati when we were walking off the court, and I'd been inducted into the Hall of Fame that previous year, and we, we won a very close game. The guy yelled down at me, he says, Hey, Beheim, you might be in the Hall of Fame, but you're probably the worst in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> I still take that as a compliment. <laughs> the... Uh, <laughs> I tell you my, I'll tell you the Bill Bradley story. He was a hundred years ago. We, I helped hold him to 37 points in Madison Square Garden. <laughs> he was a pretty good player. I tell you one other story about Bill Bradley. We were going to play them in the Miami tournament, and we all were staying at the same hotel. And, uh, you know, you're excited to be in Miami Beach. We left Syracuse. It was minus two. We get to Miami. It's 88. and sunny. Of course, we hadn't seen the sun for quite a long time. But I remember getting to the hotel. And in those days, you didn't know who Bill Bradley was. He was a sophomore. He was a great player. But you never heard about him. He wasn't picked to be the number one pick in sixth grade, like they are now. And you'd never seen him play on television, high school and college yet. So we were curious. We'd read about how good he was, but we didn't really know who he was. So we're in the hotel for a couple days and waiting to go to practice. And the elevator was right next to a kind of a library room in the hotel which I don't know, haven't been in that many hotels that have that kind of room, but it happened to be in this hotel. And every day from, we'd get up at nine till, really till midnight, 
there's one guy in the library with eight books out. And I'm thinking, who's this guy? And of course, we go to practice, and as we finish, Princeton comes out, and here's that guy <laughs> coming out who's been in the library for two and a half days, like 10 straight hours. And that was Bill Bradley. That's how you get to be a great player and a Rhodes Scholar, I guess. I tell you, I met Etan Thomas in the spring of his junior year. And it was really out of the blue. A coach called me from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and said, Coach, you need to recruit this kid in Tulsa. I said, well, you know, okay. We normally don't recruit in Oklahoma. Uh, but, you know, I'm willing to talk. And I said, well, who's recruiting him? Nobody. <laughs> well, so you want me to come? We were in the top ten at the time. You want me to come to Oklahoma to look at your player who nobody in Oklahoma is recruiting? He's good, coach. I said, okay. So I went out there. I saw him and met Etan. And, you know, obviously uh, we saw a short workout. And, you know, the guy is a pretty good player. Uh, a great kid, a great kid to talk to about everything. And so I was intrigued, and we followed Etan in the summertime and watched him play in the summer events, and obviously he uh, showed that he was a good prospect, a very good prospect, and we recruited him and uh, were able to, a couple schools tried to sneak in there on us, but we were able to get him to come to Syracuse, and he became a great player for us. That's part of the story. Uh, it took a year or two, but he worked his way in to be the best player, best center in the conference, the Big East Conference, defensive player of the year in the conference. And here's a guy that really wasn't rated in the top 100 who's now the number nine pick in the draft his senior year. A tribute to tremendous hard work and, and dedication to the game. But what always impressed me with Etan is coaches, we coach a certain way and we push and we push. And one thing I learned, I think in coaching, you teach and you learn. If you're, a, if you're a good teacher, I think you learn from the people who you coach. And I learned something from a time that's really helped me. That you have, in a, in a way I knew it, but you, there's, you cannot handle every student the same. You cannot handle every player the same. And what works with one player doesn't work with the other player. And I found that the times I would get most vocal with Etan would be when he his performance would drop the most. So I made a, a deal with him that I was going to be less vocal. I might be thinking about yelling at you, but I'm not going to yell at you. And so there were a couple of occasions after that time that I said to Etan, Etan, trust me, right now, I am screaming inside. <laughs> but through it all, uh, he was always thoughtful, always cared about his teammates, what they were thinking, what they were doing, cared about his coaches, and in general cared about people. And, you know, in athletics today, we, there, there's not all good, obviously. There's a lot of things that we would like to change, a lot of things we'd like to be better at. But there are a lot of Etan Thomases, and I was fortunate to have this one. There's a lot of guys that do the right things, are very conscious of the people around them, of their role, of their academics. Uh, and, and I think... Sometimes those things get overlooked a little bit in the headlines that we do have, which are not always great. But the one thing with Etan Thomas, he always cared about his teammates and his team and his university and the people in the university, not just the athletes, all the students. He always interacted with all the students. And sometimes in athletics you get... For seven months, you're just constantly trying to get better at what you do and get through a season which is really too long, 
uh, too many demands, but Itan always got through that, took care of all that, but was also good with everybody else. And those are the guys that always go on, they always do all right, they always know what they have to do in life. And we've been fortunate to have a lot of those guys, uh, high school principals, doctors, lawyers, teachers, who've come through our program, but nobody is really a better example, uh, I think, than Etan in so many ways. Another guy sitting right out here played with him, Lazara Sims, is right from here in Syracuse. And same kind of person works back now here in the community in the city of Syracuse where he was grown, where he grew up. But these guys are special guys. They're not just great players, which they both were. But they're great people, and the reason I'm here tonight when I'm struggling to get through this season as best we can uh, is because this is a, a special guy, and uh, he, he means a lot to me in this program for what he's done for us on the court, but what he's really done for us off the court because he's an example of what? we're trying to produce. It doesn't always work, but it certainly worked in this case. I'm very proud that I, and very glad that I took that two-stop plane to Tulsa, Oklahoma, which I probably wouldn't do if I got the same call today, but I'm very happy I did, and very proud to present to you Etan Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, Coach Beheim. And Atan, welcome back to the campus. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks, Coach, for that introduction. The team's not that bad. They're playing hard. <laughs> They're playing hard, so I'm in there rooting with them. So let's talk a bit about uh, your book, we matter, and let's let's talk for a little while, and then we'll see what questions folks in the audience want want to ask. Because I'm sure I'm sure there's a lot of them out there. But um, let me just start with something real basic. I mean, tell me about the decision to write this book. How'd you how'd you make that decision? Well, there's so much going on right now in society. Um, so much going on right now with with athletes using their voices in kind of an unprecedented way um, since the '60s. I mean, in the 60s, you had a lot of athletes that were always using their voices, speaking on different things and things of that nature. But now you're having almost this resurgence. And I wanted to try to capture it. I wanted to talk to some of the athletes that I grew up admiring, like uh, Bill Russell and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and uh, John Carlos. And, you know, it was, it was Oscar Robertson. And it was great, really, being able to interview them. But then I wanted to talk to some of the, the current athletes who are using their positions and their platforms, like Carmelo Anthony and D. Wade and Russell Westbrook and, you know, Eric Reed, who was kneeling down with Kaepernick the whole time, and, you know, Torrey Smith, and who was Kaepernick's teammate, and really just talk about this whole thing of activism and what it actually was that's really caused this resurgence. And, um, you know, it was, it, was, it was a great project. It's, it's one of those projects where you don't really know how it's going to go when you first start it mm -hmm. because you don't know who is going to really want to sit down and talk with you and how in-depth they're going to want to go. But I was really surprised and pleasantly surprised at how, you know, I sat there and talked with Bill Russell for, you know, like 45 minutes and he wanted to keep talking and how in-depth he went and Kareem and, you know, all these different guys. And it, it, was, it was really, it was really a, a great project. To, to, to do. And so what do you um, hope that the book accomplishes? What, 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 what's the goal? What are the goals for the book? Well, a lot of different things. You know, I wanted to definitely highlight the activism um, from the past, from the players that I, that I mentioned. I want to really highlight the, the athletes in the present. But I really wanted to do something that was inspirational for the athletes of the future. So they could really just see yeah. the, 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 the athletes and the, 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 the amount of of courage that it takes for them to be able to stand up for what they believe in and, and the way it is, it is perceived and the things that they're going to come across and then talk about the criticism that's going to come and, and, you know, just the entire gambit of it. And, um, you know, there, there, there's so much, you know, I, I, the, one of the main topics that we talked about in, in the book was um, police brutality. 
And I really saw that as being one of the things that really catapulted this resurgence mm -hmm. of athlete activism here in the present. I mean, and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to dive into that. And I wanted to talk to, you know, Carmelo Anthony about, you know, when he went and, and, and marched with the people of Baltimore after Freddie Gray was murdered. And I wanted to talk to, you know, why D. Wade and the entire um, Miami Heat wore the, wore the hoodies in support of Trayvon Martin. Um, after Trayvon Martin was murdered down in, down, in, down in Florida and really talk about the entire aspect and really peel back the layers, hmm. you know, as to why they're getting involved and what it means to them and how they personalize it. And so it was, you know, it's, some interviews were a little bit tougher to do than others, but, um, you know, I was really happy doing all of them. Yeah, I want to come back and ask you about a couple of those, but, but let me stick with something else here first. Tell, tell me a little bit about your own commitment to social activism and social values. Where, where, does that, where does that come from for you? Well, when I was um, younger growing up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, the, the, the athletes that my mother really introduced me to and had me read about were those athletes, the Muhammad mm -hmm. Ali's, Jim Brown's, the, you know, John Carlos and Tommy Smith and everything like that. And I'm so, you know, those athletes that use their positions as platforms. So that's really kind of what I grew up kind of wanting to become. You know, I, was, I went to, um, in high school, I joined the speech and debate team. So I was, you know, debating different topics around Tulsa, Oklahoma, and talking about different things and using my platform. And, you know, it just kind of continued on uh, through college and then through the pros. And um, did your experience here at SU contribute there, to it? Now? I did. You know, a funny story. You know, so my first, my first week here at Syracuse, um, me and a, a football player, Roland Williams, we were, we were here right on campus, right out there, and there was a big rally, um, and they were protesting the, the campus security being able to use pepper spray. So the, the, the thought was that, you know, they were using pepper spray, the first people they were going to spray was us at the underground parties and the shine parties and things of that nature when, you know, there's a, there's a little altercation or there's a little argument and they pepper spray everybody. So that was the, the, the fear. So we were there, uh, me and Roland Williams, big, he's a big six, seven football player, me standing there next to him. And we were there at the rally, so then you had the rally going on, you had everybody in the background, you had a person with a microphone, then you had me and Roland Williams, and it's the, the Syracuse Orange, um, and the Daily Orange, they, they captured that picture, and that was on the front of the cover. So, so that was my first, my first uh, week here at Syracuse. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, I don't even know if Coach remembers this. I remember he uh, had to pull me into his office afterwards. He said, oh, so you're, uh, you're into a lot of different stuff, huh? <laughs> and I said, I said, yeah, yeah, I am. And he said, uh, you know, that, that's, that's good that you, you know, if you, if you use your position and you speak out about something, make sure that you can back it up. And that's all he said. And I was like, huh, okay, I, I get what he's saying. And I, I saw later on what he actually meant by that because when you do speak out about something, you have to be able to defend your position, you have to be able to articulate it, and you're gonna have people who are gonna be able to, who are gonna want to come against you to try to discredit you or, you know, then you have to be able to defend your position. And it was a, a great learning experience from, from that point on, and I just kind of continued uh, doing the activism. I mean, a lot of people ask me if I've had any kind of pushback you know, when I was here at Syracuse mm -hmm. or, you know, people telling me, okay, don't speak about that, you know, kind of be quiet, put your, you know, head down and just continue doing what you're doing. And I didn't really experience that. You know, I didn't. I mm -hmm. experienced supportive coaches. You know, of course, they want to make sure that you're, you know, putting your work in on a basketball court, you know, and taking care of your, your school work. But I didn't get any, any kind of pushback as far as, you know, Activism, And that's one of the things that I wanted to do with the book is to be able to really encourage young people to use their voices. Um, you know, there's so much going on right now, and, you know, athletes have a lot of power. And this, this topic came up a couple times uh, in our conversations today on campus with students. Um, but uh, uh, it concerns the, it, how things, whether and how things are, are different in this regard of speaking out and social activism uh, for women athletes. Mm. 
as opposed to, to, to men, and, and in particular, uh, African-American women athletes. What, what are your thoughts about that? Well, one of the things that I did in the, in the book was I, I interviewed um, Swing Cash and Tamika Catchings, mm -hmm. and I, I wanted to talk to them specifically about the way the WNBA reacted to the, to the murders of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just to refresh everybody's memory, there was back-to-back murders of, um, you know, it's like right, you know, it happened like on a Wednesday, then everybody's reading about this, then the next Thursday you're reading about a whole different uh, murder, and the WNBA was in season then. So what they did, and it was really kind of unprecedented, like I haven't seen a entire league do this, um, but they all band together, and they, they first, they wore the, the Black Lives Matter shirts and things of that nature, and they, um, the WNBA presidents told them, okay, if you, if you wear that again, you know, you're going to be fine because that's not the warm-up uniform. So then, you know, and it first started off with just Minnesota and kind of New York, and I think maybe one other team doing it. So then they all started doing it together. And then they said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to have a, you know, a, a media blackout where we're just going to, you know, make a general statement after the game, and then the only questions that we're gonna deal with from the media are questions revolving around what's going on in society right now. We wanna talk about you know, police reform, one of the things that, are, that need to be done in order to ensure that this doesn't keep happening, you know, what we can do as an entire country to be able to fix this problem that we have. And I was just watching that, and I was just like amazed, like wow, they were all on the same page, and they all did it together. And I really wanted to highlight that in the book mm -hmm. because, you know, first of all, the WNBA, you know, they don't make what the NBA players make. You know, they don't have that type of monetary power. But the togetherness that they showed was something that was just, it was just amazing to me. I really wanted to be able to highlight that. And you mentioned that you had a supportive environment here at SU for the kinds of things that you were speaking about and being involved in. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you see the both the responsibility and the risks for players um, at the college level or even at the high school level um, speaking out about these things. I wonder if that's different than in the pros. Well, you could look at see what you what's going on with with young people around the country. Like right now, the young people in Florida. Mm. And the way that they're using their voices and the way that they're using, they're, they're collecting, they're not, they're not athletes, they're not, you know what I mean, somebody, but they're collectively using their voices. And it's really admirable. Like, they're, 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 it's so courageous, you know, when I'm watching them and they're, they're talking about the specifics that they want with gun reform and, and the, the things that they want to happen and background checks and, you know, you know, certain guns to be banned, like AR-15, they're going down the list and things that should make sense to everybody. But, you know, they're getting the same level of criticism that, you know, an athlete would get. They're mm -hmm. getting you know, they shouldn't be talking about this. You know, they're, maybe they're, they're frauds, maybe they're act, all these different mean-spirited things that I've heard, you know, and I'm like, wow, these are high school teenagers and they're attacking them like this. And, and it just, you know, I'm looking at them and the courage that they have to, to show to be able to withstand that level of criticism. And, you know, it, when you look at young people like that, um, you know, you feel good about where, you know, the direction of things are going, you know, for young people to be able to stand up for what they believe in that way. And, um, you know, that's really what, you know, there's so much, there's so much going on and there's so many things that, that, you know, young people are being vocal about from the, from the college standpoint to the, to the high school age. And after, after Kaepernick took his knee, you know, you heard, you saw different high school players from around the country taking a knee, but then talking about why they were and articulating the different things of, of that they had issues with in society. They weren't just, you know, it's not just little simple answers, you know, but they're really actually breaking down the nuances of what's going on. And, you know, the, the, you, you, things are, every movement that has happened, you know, through the past has always been ignited by young people. And it, it, it's great to see that continuously happening. Yeah, and to flip it around, mm -hmm. thinking about the other side is coaches and management sort of at the, at, the, at, at the top of the organizational chart. Right. Um, how does it play out for them? Are, 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 they, do, are they able to reach perhaps audiences with this message when they support their players that the players can't reach? Definitely. Well? Um, you know, I interviewed Steve Kerr in the book, and he talked about the way that he um, 
works with the warriors and how they dialogue about different things and they talk about different, you know, they, there's, there's a lot that they feel and they're very vocal and he gives them the, the freedom and the flexibility to be able to be vocal. You know, and I, I, I talked about uh, Coach Beheim when he, when he, you know, used his, his moments. It was when you, you had your, I don't remember what number it was, but it was a, a big number of wins. And he used that moment to talk about gun reform. And it was mm. after one of the shootings. And it's so terrible because there's been so many, I don't even remember which shooting it actually was. You know, but he used that moment to talk about how we need to do something with gun reform. And then people heard him. You know, you, you talked about Greg Popovich and how he's using his platform right now and Stan Van Gundy. And so there, there's so many things that are going on right now. Kareem's, one of Kareem's main points in the book was that, was that he didn't want it to be solely on the athletes. He didn't want it to solely because, of course, the athletes can, can move the needle, but he doesn't want it just to be on their shoulders. He wanted everybody to be able to use their voice. You know, and uh, whether, you're, whether you're a coach or whether you have a nine to five or whether you're a student or whether you're a high school player, he was really trying to encourage everybody to continuously speak their mind and stand up for what they believe in. So obviously one person that's also had a voice in this issue and, and no uh, discussion of athletes and activism, I suppose, would be complete without some discussion of the president. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I wanted to get your take on on President Trump getting involved in this national conversation um, about athletes and activism, sometimes in a pretty direct and, and uh, unvarnished way. Unvarnished uh, way, yeah, I guess <laughs> so you could say that. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, when you have somebody like the President of the United States who, who, who makes it known that they do not respect your position um, or your right to be able to speak out. It could either do one of two things. We could either silence you or kind of empower you. Mm. And I think with Trump doing that, especially with the NFL players where he directly, mm -hmm. you know, made it very much known that he, what he wanted them to do and what he wanted them not to do, it, it kind of ignited a, 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 a different fire under them where... This past season, you know, I've seen probably more activism from the NFL than I can like really remember. Yeah. I mean, of course, it started, you know, with Kaepernick taking a knee, but since then, you know, it's just been so many NFL players using their platforms and not just simply saying, like, you know, like Tori Smith, who I interviewed in the book, and, you know, after they won with the, with the, um, the Super Bowl, you know, he said he's not going to the White House, but he didn't just say, you know, I'm not going to the White House because I don't like Trump. He didn't just say that. He broke down exactly why he wasn't going to it. You know, he broke down what, he, what Donald Trump represents, you know, even politics aside of, 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 of how he conducts himself, how it is offensive to Tory Smith and how he wouldn't go to any party of somebody that has those qualities. Mm. You know, and th that's a lot for somebody to say publicly. You know, people got to understand that the level of criticism that comes whenever an athlete speaks out it's, for instance, um, if everybody saw Laura Ingram and just recently how she criticized um, LeBron James and Kevin Durant, they were having a conversation and they were talking about Trump and they were talking about different things that were going on in society, and different things they wanted to be changed. And, you know, Laura Ingram said that basically they didn't have the right to speak, you know, and then she attacked their character then attack their intelligence, mm -hmm. you know, almost like, you know, they, they shouldn't be someone who, who would be speaking on any subject that has to do with anything outside of basketball, and then she told them to shut up and dribble. Now, that's not a new concept of someone disagreeing with you and then telling you to just shut up and play. You know, Bill Russell talked about that a lot in the book about when mm. he was playing with the with the Celtics and, you know, while he was winning championship after championship, there were a lot of people that wanted him to only focus on basketball and only, you know, focus on winning championships and not to talk about anything else that was going on. And, and that's just to tell him to shut up and dribble. And it's it's just an interesting concept that, you know, us, us sitting here right now, we should be able to talk about a topic disagree with it, you know, and we debate the actual topic, 
talk about the actual things that we have differences of without having to attack each other personally. Mm -hmm. And just where we are right now in society is that when you disagree with somebody, it goes into a personal attack. You don't even talk about the issue anymore or what it is that you disagree with. And, you know, we should be able to, you know, as President Obama used to say, former President Obama used to say, um, disagree without being disagreeable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with athletes, whenever anybody can say they're supportive of them, um, using their platform and speaking out when they agree with them. That's not really hard to do. But when they disagree with them, then that's when the shut up and play part comes. And that's the part that's, you know, it's an interesting dynamic. And it, it came up a lot in the book as I was interviewing different people of that, they, that they've heard that repeatedly. Mm. I've got a, a few more questions I want to ask you about the book, but I want to go into something else for a minute and then come back to it. Um, as as uh, the dean mentioned, um, you know you've you've written you've written some other things, and uh, you've written about being a father in a book titled "Fatherhood: Rising to the Ultimate Challenge." I was curious to hear how your commitment to social justice influences the way you are as a parent. Well, it influences a lot. I mean, in, in fatherhood, I wanted to get a collective voice of a lot of different athletes to be able to really inspire. Um, young people in a lot of different ways. Maybe not not just to be good fathers, but also to be able to know that if you come from a situation where you don't have a father in in your home, that you can still make the right choices and the right decisions and be successful in life. And I wanted them to not just hear it from me saying it, but I wanted to hear them hear Kevin Durant say it and talk mm -hmm. about his story and hear you know different players talk about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was really a motivational book. And it went over, you know, very well because a lot of times we, I would be at different events, and you know, young people, especially when you come to the question and answer session, they were like, "Oh wow, I never knew that this person had to go through all of this." You know, they see the person on TV, or they see him, you know, dunking and shooting three pointers, or doing whatever they're scoring touchdowns, whatever they're doing, but they don't know the 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 road that they had to climb to get to where they are. So that was the the, the motivation to make that book. And you're also a poet. And uh, so speaking of fathers and sons and, and poetry, uh, I understand you've got a, a poem that you want to share, and, and you're going to get some help here tonight in sharing yeah. it, correct? Yeah, well, you get some help. So I, you know, I'm somebody who has always loved poetry since the time I was in middle school. And we, I, my son kind of picked it up, and he loved poetry as well. And we, he did a lot of watching and asking questions during the whole Kaepernick ordeal. Um, watching how things played out, watching how things were going, and he had a lot of questions, a lot of things that he didn't quite understand. Of, and a lot of times he was connecting dots that um, I was pretty impressed that he connected. And so he, he wrote a poem about Kaepernick, and I, I, I put it in the book. Um, and actually, if we could let him just re recite it, are we all right with you? Come on up, Malcolm. All right, so this is my son, Malcolm. Get you a mic. So just to let you know, the way that you do with poetry, when you hear a part that you like or you agree with a part that you like, you snap. Okay? All right, go ahead, Malcolm. <laughs> Colin Kaepernick. He's carrying on a tradition of athletes taking a stand for what they believe is right. Who have gone through the thought of losing their jobs just to stand up to the fight. People like Muhammad Ali, John Carlos, Tommy Smith, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bill Russell, Mahmoud abdul Rauf, Craig Hodges, and many others stood up, even if it meant taking a few of the commentators' bites. Criticizers. Haters who want to create a negative association because they disagree with the overall presentation of his message. So during the national anthem, he took a knee. That represented the captivity of brown and black people in the so-called land of the free, where our veterans fought so we would have the right to be the home of the brave, or so they say. Oh, say, can you see? They tried to say he was disrespecting the military. 
But if they really cared about their well-being, we wouldn't have so many homeless veterans and able to get medical treatment for their post-traumatic states. We wouldn't have veterans sleeping on sidewalks and under bridges and able to get jobs or put food on their families' plates. With all their stand and take off their hats to honor those that served in the military during the games, when they get back from wars, actually fighting for the United States, they kick them to the curb, push them out like trash cans on garbage day. But they didn't like Kaepernick taking a knee to call foul on their play, so they attacked his character and ridiculed and mocked, chastised and criticized, pointed fingers and talked, said he was anti-American, using the television to try to tear him down because he called out what wasn't right. They're all for athletes using their voices until they say something that they don't like. Mm-hmm. Hypocrites. I see them same exact media people that bring my daddy onto their shows to try to get him to criticize current athletes, saying, where are the modern-day Muhammad Ali's and Jim Brown's today? But as soon as a Colin Kaepernick talks about racism and police brutality, they want to tell him to shut up and play. Hypocrites, I tell you. Much respect to Colin Kaepernick, posing with a Black Panther fro with a pick in it. He talked of injustice that was everywhere as far as the eye can see. He refused to be forced to choose between one bad and one worse presidential people. He said both choices sucked. The lesser of two evils wasn't good enough options to work with. They were straight cheating the people, like AAU tournaments. And now, the NFL is trying to blackball him keep him from playing, saying he's a negative influence and a distraction from the rest of the team is what they are claiming. They say he's a bad person, as if Dan Snyder's a model citizen for his Washington football team organization. Using a racist name that he know good or well is offensive to Native Americans. Y'all got rapists, murderers, and wife beaters that y'all suit up with no hesitation. Repeated domestic violence offenders that y'all give standing ovations. But y'all have the nerve to let it come out y'all mouths that Kaepernick is the one who's bad for your NFL organization? Y'all a bunch of hypocrites. My man Kaepernick donated 60 tons of food to Somalia. Just gave $50,000 to Meals Long Wheels. He holds Know Your Rights camps for youth in different cities, teaching them the real deal. He gave money to Standing Rock. He wanted the Dakota pipeline that was going to desecrate their sacred land, poison their water supply, and even further, destroy their lives to stop. He stood outside a New York City parole office and donated custom-made suits to men who just got out of jail. He's getting them ready for job interviews. Seattle send them right back into y'all prison cells. And he donated a million dollars to Black Lives Matter. He's doing all of this out of the kindness of his heart. And y'all questioning his character? All this hypocrisy is just too much for me. Maybe my 12-year-old mind just doesn't understand y'all grown-up rationality. But I do know that a real revolutionary can never be stopped. And if they continue to blackball Kaepernick from the NFL, we need to not just whisper, not just threaten, but actually boycott. Thank you. You must be pretty proud. That's my little man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, Malcolm. Thanks. Uh, let me ask you a few questions specifically about some of the people that you talked to okay. for your book. Uh, and, and, you know, the book relies a lot on interviews that you conducted, as you already mentioned, with different uh, prominent athletes, um, relatives of, of victims. Uh, and others who are involved in the media or sports. I was curious to hear, of all of those folks, what was the hardest interview for you to do? Well, the hardest interviews were definitely the um, family of the victims of police brutality. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to really take it back to what it was really about. You know, the, 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 the 
message and the reason for Kaepernick kneeling and everything like that kind of got shifted to being about the military and about the flag and things of that nature. But it was really about the, the victims of police brutality. That's what really was the thing that really mm -hmm. stood out and caused a lot of people. So I, I went to um, Eric Garner's daughter, Emerald Snipes, and Trayvon Martin's brother, and um, um, Eliza Castile, who was Philando Castile's sister, mm -hmm. and uh, Terrence Crutcher, um, who got murdered in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, his sister, Tiffany Crutcher. And those were really hard. I mean, I gotta be honest with you, those were hard interviews to do. Um, you know, I'm talking to Trayvon Martin's brother, and he's, he's, he tells me that, you know, if it weren't for athletes, you know, a lot of people wouldn't know my brother's name. And mm -hmm. I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, when, when, when everything happened and Trayvon was killed, we tried, he said that the entire family, his mother, his father, everybody were trying to get the papers to cover the story. Um, and tell everybody what's happened, and nobody would cover it. He said, they were like, well, a young black man got killed? That, that's it? That's the story? That's not news? I was like, that's what they told you? He was like, yeah, we tried for a long time. And if it weren't for the athletes, wouldn't, wouldn't nobody know about it? And, you know, Eric Garner's daughter um, said that when she saw, turned on the TV and she saw all the NBA players wearing the shirts that said I can't breathe. She's talked about how emotional she became and how it, you know, it, it's like somebody is finally hearing her and, you know, that they care and that, you know, that she's having all of these nightmares and she can't sleep and everything like that. And, you know, she's seeing the athletes are supporting her. You know, and I, I you know, interviewed Terrence Crutcher's daughter, Tiffany. She talked about specifically on Russell Westbrook um, who of course plays for the Thunder, went on TV afterwards and talked about the injustice of seeing the video of what happened with Terrence Crutcher and how he was outraged by it. Mm -hmm. And she talked about how when she saw that, you know, her, her, how her father just kind of broke down into tears. So they're telling me all these stories and I'm sitting there listening to them and, you know, sometimes I got to like, you know, take a deep breath to keep my composure and things of that nature. And, you know, when, when, when Eliza Castile was doing the interview, she had to pause for a minute one time because she was getting emotional talking about it and talking about how much she missed her brother and how much she, you know, really um, wanted to hug every WNBA player that stood up for her brother and things of that nature. And, and it was just, it just brought back, you know, what it was all about, you know, the, the reason of, of these athletes and what pushed them to really be able to, to, to stand up and speak out, even though they know a whole lot of people are going to disagree with them and come down with them. Mm -hmm. But then when you hear the impact that it has from the family of the victims, it's just, you know, it just, just, just gets you. Mm -hmm. And th those were definitely the, the toughest ones for me to do. What about the interview that surprised you the most? Who told you something you just weren't expecting to hear? Um, I think I, I interviewed Chris Hayes, and he was so excited to talk about something other than Trump. Um, <laughs> he, he didn't want the interview to end. <laughs> and um, I, I said, well, you know, I was like, well, do you have to talk about Trump all the time? He was like, every news station has to talk about Trump <laughs> all the time, whether it's CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, yeah, it's all we talk about. So he was just happy to talk about anything else. Mm. And he was really wanting to, to examine the dynamic of, you know, the, the, of fandom and then, you know, kind of almost hatred and how it goes from one to the other mm. when someone, an athlete, says something that a person disagrees with, how they go from, you know, having the person's jersey and having their, their, their sons and their daughters wear their jerseys and their numbers to, like, almost wanting to burn their jerseys and, you know, despising them and hate mail and things of that nature when they say something that they don't agree with. So, you know, I think that was, I didn't think he was going to get that, that deep with it, but yeah, he, he had a lot that he wanted to say. And was there one person that you really wanted to interview and, and could never get an interview with? That, that well, I wanted, to, and I wanted to interview Kaepernick. Yeah. Um, That's one person I really yeah. wanted. And I had to respect that his, his, his decision to really just stay completely silent at the time, um, he wasn't really saying anything to anybody. Right. He wasn't talking at all. 
And uh, I understood it. And some, some, sometimes I wanted him to, it's like, hey, he got to say something, defend his position. They're, they're twisting his message. They're saying this. They're, you know, but I, I understand why also he didn't want to say anything because, you know, anything that he would have said would have been used against him. Anything, mm -hmm. you know, they, would, they was trying to look for anything to, to twist. He's already made the statement. He said specifically what him kneeling was about. He laid it out. And, um, you know, and still, they still took that and twisted it and said it was about the flag, it's about the military. So I interviewed his teammates, um, I interviewed Eric Reed that was right there with him, and um, I interviewed Toy Smith, and, and it was interviewed Anquan Bolden, and they, um, it was a lot, you know, it was a lot. There was a, a, lot, of, a lot that came from that. Um, Dr. Harry Edwards, who was his mentor, uh, we talked a lot about mentorship and how it, how important mentorship is, especially with athletes with activism. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, Dr. Harry Edwards talked about how how much he took his time and did his research before making a statement or before you know it can't it can't be a, like a knee jerk reaction. Mm -hmm. And how important mentorship is to really be able to guide you know the 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 person in, in the right right direction. You know, I, I interviewed. Um, Eliasha Shabazz, who is Malcolm X's daughter, mm. and she talked about the way that Malcolm X mentored Muhammad Ali. And she said, you know, if it wasn't for that mentorship, he would just been the greatest fighter. But there was a, a whole different side that, that Malcolm X brought out of Muhammad Ali and kind of sparked this interest and he started learning and, and then, you, then you have the Muhammad Ali that we all know. And one of the things that, that really stuck out that, that Leila Ali said uh, who was Muhammad Ali's daughter. Um, and we knew this, but just hearing her say it kind of just reemphasizes mm. it that, you know, right now everybody loves Muhammad Ali. Everybody, they build statues and museums, everything like that. But back, back in the day, back in the 60s, that's not the way that Muhammad Ali was viewed by mainstream America at all. I remember that. And, you know, he was really vilified. And when he was standing up and saying the things that, you know, he was not going to go to the war and he was, you know, everything that he was doing, um, he was almost like public enemy number one. And it took a long time, you know, and then you kind of appreciated who Muhammad Ali was. And I think that you look from decades from now, and you're going to see a uh, different appreciation for Kaepernick. Mm. Um, you're not going to see it right now, but 30, 40 years from now, you're going to be, you know, young people are going to be reading about Kaepernick, and there's going to be just a different level of, of appreciation. You mentioned that the core of the book really is driven by um, the reaction to police brutality and, mm -hmm. and the behavior and actions of people in the criminal justice system, but your social activism goes back a long way and has has uh, been about different things. And I wanted to ask you about an earlier moment for you. Mm -hmm. um, you came out in 2003 against the Iraq War mm -hmm. uh, as a player. Um, tell me a little bit about that decision and whether you faced some of the pushback that you've been describing uh, along the way here and how you dealt with it. Right. Well, it was an interesting dynamic because I was playing for the Washington Wizards in the nation's capital. Um, you know, George W. Bush just made the connection from um, between 9 and 11 and, mm -hmm. and Iraq somehow. Somehow there was a connection. And, you know, I'm looking at everything and I'm like, well, wait a minute, what does Iraq have to do with, you know, I was like, I'm not seeing the, you know, and I was just really a Against it, and then I saw. I was like, "Wait a minute!" I'm looking at all the different dynamics of it, and looking at the oil, and looking at everything. And so I, I wrote this, 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 a couple of poems about it, and speeches. And I started performing different places in D.C. You know, some were small, some were huge. And uh, one place in particular, one rally in particular, was at the at the right on the mall, and there were thousands of people there, and you know it. it it was one of those situations where, looking back on it, at that time, it was really a big risk because there weren't really that many people mm -hmm. talking against the war in Iraq. And it was kind of, you know, it was like Michael Moore, the Dixie Chicks, a few other people. You know, I mean, right now, everybody looks back on us and say, even Republicans are like, no, that, that wasn't a good idea. But back then, you didn't really hear too much. Right. 
And so I, I, I did that and I spoke of the war and it kind of went viral before going viral was the thing because we didn't have social media like that, you know, so <laughs> it was, it, it just went viral. And I was kind of surprised to see the level of reaction that I did, you know, there was mm. strong, like all the way on one side, we absolutely love you, that's great what you did, you're amazing, but then on the other side, it was like, you know, you shouldn't even be here in America, you know, like you need to go back to Africa, you need to go, like th those are the, the level of, of hate mail that I got received, um, delivered to the, the Ryzen Center. You know, I, I mean, I played, with, I played with Michael Jordan, so Michael Jordan would come and he would get big boxes of letter, like every day, you know, big boxes of letter, here's your letter. You know, I would get like maybe a few little letters, um, <laughs> usually from Syracuse people, <laughs> you know, asking to sign a whole Syracuse card or something like that. Intended for somebody else, maybe. <laughs> right, just, I, I wasn't on that level. But then after that happened, I started getting big boxes. Yeah. And a lot of the people were very upset that mm -hmm. I said what mm -hmm. I said. And, um, you know, that was kind of an interesting, you know, it was one of those situations where I guess I didn't really think it all the way through, you know, because, you know, of course people are going to be very upset by that. But I, I, one of the things that I wanted to do in the book was talking about the support that I had from the, from the management at the Wizards mm. organization. And, and, you know, they didn't say that they were going to punish me. They didn't say they were going to silence me, they didn't, any of that nature. I just never really experienced that. You know, I didn't experience that here in Syracuse. I didn't experience that with the Wizards. I didn't, you know, I was drafted to the, uh, the Dallas Mavericks. I wanted to interview uh, Mark Cuban and say, and say how he thought about activism. Uh, Adam Silver, who was the commissioner of the, of the NBA. I mean, I wanted to be able to get their opinions on um, activism and how they view it. Because the, the prevailing notion is that if you say something, you know, that you're going to get in trouble. You're going to mess up your chances. You're not going to be able mm -hmm. to move up the, you know, and it's kind of like a scare tactic. And, and I wanted to really show, especially young people, that, you know, of course you have to, you know, think it through and, 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 the right, and present your argument the right way and things of that nature, but not to be afraid to use your, your position or your platform. So I just got a couple quick questions about basketball before, okay. before we turn over to the audience. We've got the coach here. There's one question I want to put to you, okay. uh, uh, and that's, well, I'll just put both of these together in, 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 as a two-part. First, what, what, was, what's, what was your most memorable game here at mm -hmm. the Carrier Dome mm -hmm. and why? And second, tell us something about Coach Bayheim that people here probably don't know. Mm. <laughs> Tell some secrets, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing, um, anytime we played Georgetown was a memorable game because I just wanted to demolish them, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, anytime. I remember, we, I, I remember we went down and we played Georgetown um, in D.C. one time, and it was, this is my sophomore year, and I had like a, almost like on a breakout game. I just, we, I just dominated them, and, you know, we won by a lot. And, um, you know, going over and, and shaking Coach John Thompson's hand and looking, looking him in the eye. And, you know what I mean? It was just, that was a great, that, that's why that, 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 that rivalry is something that they have to just continue to do. I don't care what conference everybody's <laughs> in. They have to keep that rivalry. But the one thing about um, Beheim is that I, you know, and a lot of people don't know is how passionate he is about about different topics, like I talked mm, about before right. with gun reform. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think anybody really would have expected for him to, to use, especially that moment when it was really just all about him. I mean, he had, you know, his, he went past this milestone of wins and, you know, it was, it was like the, the, the Coach Beheim moment and he didn't even really want to talk about that as mm -hmm. much. You know, I think he might've said, you know, kind of thank you and then moved right back, right away from the topic and started talking about what needed to happen with gun reform and how ridiculous of, you know, some of our laws are and things. And he used his position uh, as a platform. And I, you know, I was here speaking at the uh, uh, Syracuse dinner and I congratulated him on that because seeing that it was just, just made me proud, you know, that my coach was using his position like that. So that's great. So we've, we, we've, got, we've got a bit of time if you have questions for Atan um, and we've got a couple microphones that we can run around. So if you just raise your hands, I'll, Try to, there's a hand I see right up there near the aisle, right there, yes, I'm pointing at you, and then, and then on the other side of the aisle, a little bit further back, I, I think it might be a blue sweater, there's another hand up, and we can get the microphones to those two folks, and then we'll go from there.
Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Elijah Newsom. I'm a senior in the sport management department here. Um, this is kind of a two-part question as well. So um, with more and more people recently recognizing um, their own privilege as white Americans, um, how do you think, what, what do you think that role of having that white ally, how important that is, a white ally such as Steve Kerr, Greg Popovich, or Chris Long, and then the follow-up question to that is, um, how do you, um, how can you encourage, or what advice do you have for people who agree with all these issues and consider themselves allies, but for lack of a better term, sit on the sidelines and kind of let everyone else do the talking? Um, first of all, I think why allies are very important. I mean, you, you look at the, sometimes people hear things differently when it comes from different lips. I can say it like that. Um, they hear Greg Popovich differently. You know, talking about mainstream America. They hear Steve Kerr differently. Um, they hear Chris Long differently than they would hear a Kaepernick or LeBron, even though they're Kaepernick and LeBron. And it, it's something that's really important and you don't see enough of, to be quite honest. Um, you know, with Chris Long, I, it's interesting because Chris Long has said how much he's learned from his teammates. And, and talk to them and been inspired by them. And, you know, I, I think it's great that he's using his platform the way that he is. And, you know, I, I interviewed Steve Kerr in the book and, and I asked him that. I said, you know, you don't see a lot of coaches really talking about that, especially if they're not in the NBA. Like, why is that? You know, I mean, Greg Popovich. Greg Popovich is in Texas. You know, he's in Texas and talking the way that he's talking and hasn't even really received that much criticism. You know, I mean, there's a certain level of, of, of power in that, that that other people can hear it differently. And so, you know, I would always encourage people to continue, you know, don't just stand on the sidelines. Don't just say how terrible something is and then kind of just turn the page or, you know, something like that. It, it, but, but also another thing is it's, it's something that, I've, that I had to come to grips with, and we were just talking about it today, and we was talking to the, to the students. There's a different reality that a lot of mainstream America can't even really relate to. And it's almost having to remove yourself from the comfort of yourself and try to see the world through somebody else's view, but it's not your reality. Do you know what I mean? So we were talking about the police. We were talking about the, the differences um, of when maybe you're stopped by the police and when I'm stopped by the police. There is a huge difference. I mean, to give you an example, me and my son Malcolm, who you just heard, we're coming from AAU practice and with one of his teammates, and we were stopped by the police. Um, I had a, a tail light that was out. And so we well, stopped by the police and so I turned the music down, rolled the window down, rolled all the windows down, um, turned the interior light on, put my phone here and put it on record, um, put my hands at 10 and 2, took my wallet out, put it on the dashboard. So Malcolm's looking at me doing all this stuff, and he's like, well, what are you, like looking at me like, what are you doing? And I was like, okay, well, 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 I'll explain to you later. So then he, the policeman comes, and I have to think that I have to create a non-threatening environment. That has to be my first thought, right? Because it's a matter of life and death. And my only, my only concern at that point is to get home safely and to get Malcolm and his teammate Kamar home safely, right? That's not a reality that mainstream America can really relate to because that's not what you think about when you're stopped by the police, you know? And that's a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow. It's a hard pill for young people to swallow that nothing else matters except for you getting home safely. You know, we're, there, there's, no, there's, no, there, there's no point in you trying to prove a point that we already know is true. You know, they're, they're the ones with the power and they're the ones that are afraid of you. And that's just the reality of it. So hearing Michael Bennett talk in the book about his, his interaction with the police and hearing Tabo Cephalosha talk about it and things of that nature and him, they're stressing to young people, right, that the number one objective has to be for you to get home safely. 
And that, that is something that I want young people to be able to hear, especially young black and brown people, to be able to hear from these athletes saying it because us being athletes isn't going to save us from looking as a threat to those officers. It's not. That's what LeBron James was saying, that it doesn't matter how much money he has, it doesn't, it's not going to save him from being black. That's what he was saying in that, that dialogue with Kevin Durant. And that's, that, again, is a hard concept for people to be able to understand until, if you can understand somebody being in that situation, nothing else matters. And it's an unfortunate reality, but it is reality. And it's the reality that we have to deal with. So using those, those athletes' voices to first be able to bring certain things to, to the public, and then being also be able to talk to younger people to say, no, sometimes the rules are different. Sometimes there are things that, that we just cannot do. As, as hard of a pill it is to swallow, that's the reality. The gentleman right there, yeah. Yes, Eton. Uh, my name's Thomas Clinton. Hey, I'm a professor. How you doing, doctor, sir? Uh, doctoral grad, <laughs> School of Education, 94. Um, with race being so prominent today in the news, uh, there are many allegations and denials of racism. And it seems like quite often uh, people are talking from different perspectives. And one of the things that's emphasized in doctoral study is define your terms. And I'm wondering if you have um, what you consider an acceptable definition of racism and uh, maybe some examples of subtle and not so subtle racism today. Well, there's, there's systemic racism and the racism that Kaepernick was talking about where for instance, there's a, um, okay, say there's an inner city school that's predominantly black, okay? They, um, it's, not a, it's not a school that has a lot of funding. It's not a school that, that has a lot of resources. They have uh, brand new metal detectors, but old books. And, you know, they, they, they get more funds taken away from them, okay? Now, they know that they're not getting the same education as the schools in the suburbs. They know that. They have 40 kids in the classroom. The air condition doesn't work. I mean, schools in Baltimore just this past, this past um, winter had to close down because the heater didn't work during, you know, snowstorm and stuff like that. So you know that this is happening, but you say, okay, we, we know that this is a situation that you're in, but we're going to test you to the same standards tests, standardized tests that we give all the other schools that we know have more fundings. And then when your grades and your test scores aren't the same, we're gonna say, see, that's why we don't need affirmative action in colleges, because we can't lower our standards. But you know that they're not getting the same education. That's systemic racism. You know, or we could talk about the prison, the school to prison pipeline. And the, 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 the way that there are, you know, one person does a crime, another person does the same crime, and you know, one goes to jail, one gets maybe rehab or gets not probation. And, you know, those are forms of systemic racism. And um, those are the, the issues that Kaepernick really was spelling out and saying, this is not right. Somebody has to do something about this. This is not fair. And so my message to young people is, like, I could always point out the things that aren't fair, but now I'm going to point out to you what reality is. So that means that you have to work twice as hard. And you have to know that you can't do certain things because you're not going to get away with it. You know what I mean? And you know that you're going to get twice as much of a punishment if you do the same thing that you see Johnny doing. So you have to know that going in and not even go that route. So it kind of depends on who I'm speaking to. And that's the, those are the voices that, that I wanted to echo um, those sentiments in the book. And they echoed it very, very, very nicely. There's a hand up front here, a uh, person in the white glasses, and then this gentleman over here that was snapping. We'll get you for snapping. You get to <laughs> ask the next question. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you for your international, uh, for your interesting talk. I'm an international student here. It's my second year of study in the United States. So please correct me if I, I am wrong. So as I understand, you covered in your book very deep socioeconomic issues of American society. And the, the poem of your son is a brilliant example of critical thinking of young generation. So what is uh, your direct target audience of the book? And what is the intention? Do you 
is, um, do you suspect and assume that people will continue this critical thinking or you recommend some actions, some steps which will decide these problems, solve these problems? Okay. Uh, so you're just saying um, both. Uh, I would like, I would like b both. I would like for it to um, spark critical thinking, um, spark debates, spark topics, and also I wanted to, to be able to highlight some of the things that athletes have, have specifically um, put in place that, that, have, that have worked towards tangible solutions. For instance, um, Toy Smith and, and Eric Reed talked to me about a program that they instituted after Kaepernick took a knee. So he, he took a knee, said that this is what he doesn't like about police brutality and, and systemic racism and the way that, that, that we police in our country. So they said, okay, this is what we're gonna do. Every time we go to a road game, we're gonna create these forums and we're gonna have the policemen and we're gonna have the people from the community. And we're gonna try to, to first of all, let one group hear the other group, one, one group hear the other group, right? And come with um, impacting different laws to be able to address some of the concerns. So they did that in every single city that they went to. Now I remember I, when, I, when, I, when he told me that, I was like, well, why haven't I heard so much more about this. I mean, everybody should know that y'all are doing this. This is great. This is something that is a tangible solution because each police department is, is ran completely different. It's not like a federally ran department where you have one rule and, and that's the way that everybody you know, abides by. The, the NYPD is completely different than the Tulsa Police Department, completely dif different than the LAPD. So they went to different specific police departments and now they're pushing to, do di to, to create different laws. Now Anquan Bolden formulated the, uh, a group, uh, players, athletes, I forgot the name of the group, I'm sorry. No disrespect to I can't remember the name. But they, are, they have been going to DC and lobbying for, for different laws to be able to be changed, dealing with mandatory minimums, dealing with the different impacts of, of um, bails, different things of that nature. And so they're tangibly trying to, to um, impact what this group brought awareness to. So they all kind of work together. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. See this gentleman on that far end over there. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Moya. Um, uh, an international student as well in the School of Education and I'm um, pursuing uh, disability rights and inclusive education. I couldn't help but uh, hear you speak and I can see the French philosopher Michel Foucault in terms of his description of uh, uh, regimes of power, uh, construction of knowledge. I'm doing a course called Historizing Disability and Gender and I can clearly see from my, uh, my studies now that actually we are where we are, we can easily relate to the 16th, 17th century, 18th century and where we are now. My question really is uh, fear in terms of activism, especially in terms of where I come from, Africa, is a real challenge. Uh, you'll be met with maximum force, you'll be met on, like you described on the spectrum of the extreme positive and the extreme negative uh, but in terms of the context uh, where I come from, Africa, activism, and the aspect of fear, I think you raise it a bit there. How can one overcome? Because mm -hmm. the need is great. Mm -hmm. But if you try to face the regimes of power, in the US now, I know the NFRA is a very powerful organization, and you don't want to mess, I, that, that's what I see from the media. I don't want to probably just say, but currently the young girl, in terms of our Twitter following, I just followed it. She has beaten the so-called powerful regimes of power. Uh, but now, how can one, uh, in terms of activism, intersect it with disability? Because I think disability is one group that is also lacking behind. We can clearly uh, uh, make a connection with race, gender, and class around there. But fear, how can we overcome fear? Well, one of the things that you know, we just we just had that topic. Uh, speaking at a at a organization called Interaction in LA, and that topic kind of came up. And what what I would what I would answer it was that collectively we have to find the links um, of our different groups and and work together. So if 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 this group, you know, has a common I don't want to use the word common enemy, but 
any word I, you could think of that's better than common enemy. Common interests, I'll say that. Common interests, and they're, they're from different groups, right? Whatever those different groups are, you know, the, the, one, of the things, one of the things that happens is that we, we move um, not in unison enough with different groups that are all fighting a similar fight with a similar person that wants different groups to be able to be suppressed. You understand what I'm saying? So, so that's one thing that we have to be able to do more. So for instance, in, 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 in Missouri, uh, University of Missouri, the entire school year, they were trying to fight this racism that was going on in, on campus. It was going on continuously. They, they didn't, you know, they were trying to, the president wasn't really addressing it. The, they weren't doing anything about it. The, 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 the students on campus were like, okay, something needs to give. They were fighting and fighting to do it, right? And then something changed and they connected with the football team. And the football team connected with them. We agree with you, they agree. I don't know how it connected, but it became a connection. And then they started moving together. And the football team said, well, we're gonna support them. And they threatened to boycott the game. Didn't actually get to the boycotting part, just threatened to boycott the game. And then I'm telling you, like in like two days, it's like they, the, the president went under review and then he got fired. Then this, it was like boom, 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 boom. And what, what I really learned from that, I always encourage different groups um, to, to connect with different athletes. I, I do because, you know, athletes do have a lot of, uh, of a voice, especially on campus or whether it's the professional ranks or even the high school ranks but also to connect with each other because there's strength in numbers. The reason why the, the, the WNBA couldn't just suspend, you know, the few players that did this and the few players that did that is because they all did it together and they can't get rid of everybody. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's really what I would encourage, you know, different groups right here on campus right now, you know, to start talking to each other and working with each other and because that's, that's the thing, there's strength in numbers. I understand there's a microphone on this side or there. Okay, great. Go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is Ian Williams. Um, I'm a senior sports management minor, political science minor, and also a sociology major here. I'm also the current, um, I'm also the current president of the Sport Professionals of Color here on campus. Uh, my question to you is, um, it's a two-part question. First, um, how would you, how would you educate an individual who doesn't come from a background of that's subjected to racism, that's willing to learn. How would, how would you educate them on that issue? Um, provide information, I mean, to them. And like I said before, if that's not their reality, sometimes it's hard for them to be able to, to put themselves in somebody else's shoes, you know? But you have to tell them to be able to see it from somebody else's perspective. And the reason why, to answer the, the other gentleman's question of why you don't see as many uh, white players speaking out as much is because sometimes they can't see it from somebody else's perspective. You know, but now you're seeing more in the same way that, the, that Chris Long started speaking to his teammates. And then you saw a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of different players come by and they, they weren't necessarily taking a knee, but they stood there and they put their hands um, on their shoulders showing that you know, they, they, this is not necessarily their position or, or their fight, but they're gonna stand with them and try to learn you know, what they're going through. And that's how they verbalized it. And I think it's just a matter of talking and discussing. But, but sometimes it's difficult because you know, if somebody, that's not their, their reality, then you're trying to get them to, to see everything through the reality of somebody else. And you have to make that connection with them. And part two, um, it's a question, organizations that, um, uh, how do I say it? Organizations that m mandate that there that um that there's punishments for speaking out, such as our NASCAR. Um, what would you say to those type of organizations that mm -hmm. prohibit their um, athletes from mm -hmm. standing up for um, social um, injustices? Well, I can't speak for NASCAR, but uh, I was you know happy to see a lot of organizations not do that. And, and you know that's the reason why I wanted to interview Adam Silver, who is the commissioner of the NBA, and to 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 get him on record of saying that that's not what he 
you know, subscribes to, and that's not what he does. I wanted to get Mark Cuban on record, you know, Ted Leonsis on record, saying that, that they would not do that in their organization. Um, you know, I was really proud of seeing Syracuse University make the statement that the young people who are using um, their positions and their platforms to speak out for gun control and things of that nature um, and gun reform, um, you know, whether they protest in some way that they wouldn't be punished or they wouldn't be looked down upon with their um, submissions to, to Syracuse University. That was huge. You know, now a few other universities have done that as well. You know, but to make that statement as a university, I mean, it, it, it was really powerful because, you know, the opposition is kind of calling on um, them to be punished for using their voices. So you, you, you're going to see both. This is my point. You're going to see both. Um, but really being able to have the courage to be able to do that in the face of the threat of punishment is what makes people like Muhammad Ali and Bill Russell and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and, you know, with, with John Carlos and Dr. Harry Edwards and all those people, what makes them great. You know, and, it, and it's not for everybody, hmm. you know, but that's what makes them great. Thank you. Time for one more, maybe. We'll go back over to this. Oh, you've already got the microphone, so okay, there you go. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, I'm curious um, why uh, you think basketball has become the, actually, to me, it's always been the most progressive of the sports, from uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar to Bill Russell to the late Dean Smith. It's always been uh, back the Final Four in Indiana when, when they had the uh, religious liberty law. All mm -hmm. the coaches who were at the Final Four were speaking out against it. Basketball, to me, has always seemed to be uh, at the heart of, of the progressive movement and, and has been that way for a long time. Yeah, I, I, I know. <laughs> I mean, I asked, <laughs> I asked Adam Silver that. I asked him what is different between the NBA and the NFL. You know, why is the NBA seem so much more progressive than the NFL? He didn't necessarily have an answer for me, but you're absolutely right. Uh, there, there has been. There's been a history of activism with basketball, uh, with the NBA, and it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful, rich tradition. And, but, but I will say that the NFL has had more people, you know, vocally, um, active this year, mm -hmm. especially that I've seen in a very long time. So hopefully that tradition kind of continues. I wanted to get you, because you've had your hand up for a while. Oh, yes, right there. sure. Yeah, so if you would, yes, yes. Right. So you had your hand up for a while, so I got Dale, you. Dale, Dale, go ahead. Yeah. My name is Dale Kusling. Uh, the time was my student. Mm -hmm. Can we pass the microphone up to Dale so that everyone else can hear him? I think they took it, but we can, we can hear you. Okay, all right. Oh, okay, all right, sorry. Here it comes. Thank you. Hello, Eton. There we go, how are you doing? <laughs> so I want, to, I want to ask a question about athletes' use of power. Uh, I, I agree, athletes are potentially very, very, very pow powerful. Um, and uh, th they, uh, thus far, have used their, that power primarily, or they've achieved that power primarily by putting themselves on the line, but ma making themselves subject to, to, to punishment, to, to public abuse, and so forth. Uh, but I'm glad you mentioned the coach who got, uh, sorry, the president, uh, college president who got fired once the football team got involved. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's possible that, uh, uh, that there could be a potential misuse of athletes' power. Uh, I, 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 I want to say I don't know of any instance when that's been the case including the, the, the Missouri case, the Baylor, the similar Baylor uh, case mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but how, how, uh, what criteria do you think athletes should use? How should they decide how to use this uh, potential power that they have? I got you. I got you. Well, it's, it's, um, you know, it's an interesting question. You know, I mean, I, I, one of the things that I... I I interviewed Sean King. I don't know if you don't know the writer Sean King. Um, we talked about that very topic as far as, you know, you know, should some athletes maybe not speak out? 
And, you know, I, I, think, I think there's a few things that have to happen. You have to be well-versed and well-read in the topic that you're speaking out on because the first thing that's going to happen is, you're, is that you're going to be made or tempted to be made the buffoon. And you're going to be attempted to be made that you don't have the right to speak on this topic at all. And sometimes that can make, give a reverse effect. You can have good intentions, right? But once the criticizing comes, you have to be able to articulate your position in a, in a way that they're not able to say that you shouldn't be speaking on this topic. So even, even with what we talked about before with, with Laura Ingram, um, with LeBron James and Kevin Durant, and if you remember the clip, I mean, she really made them, tried to make them out to be that they were just two of the most ignorant cats that had no business talking about anything else. Like that was her sole purpose of her segment. And the, 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 the problem is that, you know, yes, LeBron could, can come back and, and articulate his position and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm talking about this and I'm going to do this and this is my position and I'm going to stick with it. I'm not going to shut up and dribble and I'm not, but you almost have to have to know that you're going to be entering a back and forth debate dialogue where you have to defend yourself once you do step out and make an actual statement because it's actually going to come um, immediately. There's like, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You're, you're going to be um, challenged um, on your position. And, you know, the, the, the question always comes up and the word is always used is, is it an obligation of mm. athletes to be able to speak out? You know, is it something that should be, that athletes should be required to speak out, mm. you know? And, you know, I, I, I always say that I, I think more of you have a tremendous opportunity to speak out, but I wouldn't say it's an obligation because speaking out is not for everybody. You know, everybody, that's not their passion. Now, I understand it, because athletes do have the power to be able, I mean, LeBron has just as many Twitter followers than, than Trump does. When he says something, people are going to hear it. So I understand when everybody wants to push for athletes to be able to speak on this topic, say something about this, say something about this. But some people, it's not their passion. And if it's not their passion, it's gonna come across as not being their passion when they're challenged on it. So I would say that, you know, it, it's not for everybody. I, I had a little dip, different uh, idea that mm -hmm. athletes in, in their use of power could bring harm mm -hmm. and it's important that they do so only in a just way. And that's, that's essentially was my question. How, how do athletes decide when it's just for them to use this power? Well, it's and, and that's a tricky that's a tricky one because then that goes to what you what you believe is just and what you you, you know believe is unjust. So if we're taking a, a topic, whatever Absolutely. the topic whatever the topic is, Absolutely. when you're talking, you know, say the topic is abortion, and then one person feels one way and one person feels the other way, you know, it it might be where you know that person, even though that you disagree with them. That's their position, even though you feel it's an unjust position. Do you know what I mean? So like that, that, it gets kind of tricky into saying what's just and what's unjust. But the but the, the 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 topic is that athletes are going to also have different opinions, and that's okay. There is nothing wrong with somebody having a different opinion. You know, I mean, I and I use the example. We should have different opinions, and I think the dialogue is the part in in the, in the book. We talked about two teammates, um, Richard Sherman and, and Michael Bennett. And Richard Sherman and Michael Bennett had two completely different uh, opinions. Um, when they, they were viewing uh, Black Lives Matter, they were viewing the police brutality, and they had two different opinions. Um, now they had a public debate, and they articulated one side, they articulated the other side, and I think there is growth in an actual debate when two people are actually articulating different positions. They weren't just attacking each other, right? Now, of course, for myself, I agreed with one side more than the other side, Right? But both sides, I felt, had the right to speak. I don't feel that just only the people who I agreed with had the right to speak. And that's the part that becomes tricky because then it gets into saying, well, if I don't agree with you, then you should just shut up and play too. 
Atan, I, there's a, a couple things I want to say to you in closing, but before I do that, I just want to remind everyone here uh, that we are having a reception over in Eggers Hall on the second floor, and we'll also have uh, Atan's book there for signing. So please meet us over there for photos as well. Um, Atan, just to finish, let me just say two things to you. First, um, thanks for writing this book and, and for all that you do for sport and for social justice. Thank you. And the second thing is, I think you've shown us here tonight, but also with your actions over the years, um, it's a model of citizenship that, that we're proud here at SU to be associated with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks.